So let me just tell you, in the beginning, you're going to miss something. <clears throat> but I'll do my best. On the literature table, the resource table that I have set up in the back of the room, there are some blue brochures entitled Chosen People Ministries. And we would like some help in handing these out, please. We would like to get these out, one to a family, uh, if somebody could help us do that. We want to get these distributed, one to a family, and we're going to use them at the close of the service. But I want you to have them now, one to a family. Thank you for even considering going to Israel. Let me explain something to you. I've just retired as a tour guide in Israel, but uh, uh, next October, uh, next month, uh, I'm literally being drawn back to take my 73rd Bible study tour to Israel. There's no greater biblical classroom in all the world than the nation of Israel. Now, of course, it depends on who you go with and the reason you go, but there is no greater Bible classroom in all the world. To stand on the hills of the Galilee and to read Mark chapter 6 and the feeding of the 5,000 and know you're exactly where God laid the bread and the fish on the rock. It's amazing to walk up the southern steps, the very steps that Jesus used to walk in and out of the temple. It's an amazing place to be. To stand in the Garden of Gethsemane with the olives and the water and the grapes and understand that that's where Judas came and kissed the master and betrayed him for the crucifixion that's so important to all of us. It's an amazing place to be. The garden tomb, just as it was in the days of Jesus, maybe not the tomb that he laid in, but certainly a visual effect that will leave you breathless. It's an amazing place to be. There's no other place on earth that I would tell you this, invest your money, invest your time, read the Gospel of John over and over and over until you know every word, until you can stand by the pool of Bethesda and watch that blind man who'd never seen his mother stand up and praise God. It's an amazing place to be. Thank you for even considering going to Israel. You'll never, you'll never be the same. You heard the expression, you have to see it to believe it? Church, you have to see it to believe it. It's an amazing thing. Start saving now. Save your money. It's worth every penny. I have on the literature table <clears throat> some books that I want to share with you. I'm going to need some water. I drank orange juice and I drank coffee, but... Uh, I'm, I've got a lot of talking to do, and I'm going to need some water. Thank you very much. There's a little book that's on the resource table. It's called The Report. This is absolutely free. It's for you to help me. You realize that you live in the fourth largest Jewish community in the United States. Uh, actually, when we do the counties of Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach County, we actually live in the second largest Jewish community in the United States. But in our communities, in our smaller communities within the county, we live in the fourth largest Jewish community in the United States. And these people need the gospel. There's no special way of salvation. Everyone must come to the Lord the same way by grace through faith. Everyone must come to the Lord the same way. And this little booklet on the report, thank you ma'am, from Isaiah 53 is an excellent and safe, no pressure, a safe way for you to share the gospel. It goes with this book called Isaiah 53 Explained. The first purpose of this book is for you to read it. Never show a movie you never previewed. 
Never give out a book you haven't read because questions will come back. The first purpose is for you to read it. And then the second is if you get a reaction from this, this is the follow-up. If you can get a person, Jewish or non-Jewish, if you can get a person to read this, they are very open to the gospel. And what is our purpose here on earth? Behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. Our purpose to be here is evangelism. Our purpose to be here is to share the good news with others. Now, you don't have to have anything other than the Holy Spirit. But you can use methods that are more acceptable than others. And that's what this little book is about. How to introduce your Jewish friends to the Messiah. There's just certain things that are helpful to say. And there's just certain things that are not helpful to say. You don't want to go up to your Jewish friend at Dunkin' Donut and tell them, hey, if you don't accept Jesus Christ right now, you're going to die and go to hell. Yeah, it sort of closes the door when you do things like that. And this little book is to help you as far as a tool of evangelism. The moons have to do with the calendar, have to do with the biblical holy days. And here's our problem, church. You ready? Don't throw anything at me. You cannot study your Bible from the Gregorian calendar. The Gregorian calendar was invented by Julius Caesar and corrected by Pope Gregory and put in place to keep you from studying your Bible. Everything about the Gregorian calendar is reversed. But Christians today know so little about the biblical calendar and the biblical holy days and how they apply to you that they're often mistakenly referred to as Jewish holiday. How many of you know that we've just come through the time of Rosh Hashanah? And how many of you heard, referred to it as the Jewish New Year? It's not Jewish, it's not the New Year. That is an invention of rabbis who don't know the mystery that was revealed to them by the Apostle Paul because they will not read the apostolic writings when he said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. So church, if you'll know the biblical Bible, if you'll know the biblical holy days, if you'll know how these biblical holy days belong to you, they won't sneak up on you. They won't sneak up on you. You're to be a workman rightly dividing the word of truth, knowing these things. Which brings us to the land of Israel. And this little booklet, you'll notice none of these are huge great theological novels. They're written for people like me and you that just need to read something and be done with it. Israel's glorious future, which is what I'm going to talk to you about this morning. I, I've been blessed to be here several times. And I hope by now that you know that I'm not a preacher. It took me 25 years to learn that. I'd watch this preacher on TV and I'd go, man, I can do that. And I'd watch this preacher on TV and he's better than this preacher so I can do that. And after 25 years of being in full-time ministry, I learned that I was just a teacher. I, I, I don't mean just a teacher, I mean I'm a teacher. I'm not a preacher. I'm not going to stand up here like your pastor and do some great sermon and try to convince you of certain facts. I'm here to teach the Bible. And pastor has asked me to teach you Bible about the relationship of the nation of Israel and what's going on today. 
So I didn't notice any seat belt on those chairs. <clears throat> but I would ask you maybe if you wanted to take a few notes or hold on. I did promise Pastor I'd be through by 2.30, so let's get started. <laughs> Abba Father, we thank you for this opportunity to teach and to share with these people the truths of the Word of God. Abba, these people are here this morning because in your sovereign will, you allowed them to be here and they wanted to be here and they're here. And I pray, dear God, that you would open their hearts and minds and open my communication that I'd be able to share with them something that might be a blessing to them today. Since they've come to expect a blessing, help me to be a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I could tell you so many things that would startle you this morning, I'm only gonna pick out a few. Let me start by telling you that there's no such thing as Jewish people. The religion the worship, the choice of how to worship the true and living God is called Judaism. And that Judaism was maintained throughout thousands of years of history by the Hebrew people. So therefore, the Hebrew people became synonymous with the people and the religion. And then we have the land of Judah, we have the son of Jacob, we have the tribe of Judah, we have the city overlooking Judah, Jerusalem, and, and so we have a people, a Hebrew people associated with a way of worship, Judaism, so that the two have become synonymous. They have become of the same definition. But when I talk to you about Israel, and I talk to you about Israel's place in the Bible, we've got to talk about the Hebrew people. The Hebrew people are new. They're the newest of the new. You say, well, I thought they'd been around for a long time. Yeah, but you were here first. You see, when we came out of the ark, we were all one. You know what happened? with the ark, do you remember the story? I was, at a Sunday, I was at a church recently and Sunday school had just dismissed and uh, you can guess what the Sunday school lesson was on. And a little boy came up to me and he looked up at me and he said, Mister, are you Noah? <laughs> I said, no son, I'm not Noah. Thinking the conversation was over. He said, well, did you know him? <laughs> well, we were all on the ark, and the ark landed on Mount Ararat. How many good Bible teachers do we have here this morning? How'd they get out of the ark? How'd they get out of the ark? God never opens what he seals. How's the Bible say they got out of the ark? See, what happens with these things, church, is they become so lovingly familiar to us that we read right over them. You know how they got out of the ark? They took the roof off. That's the wood that they used for the sacrifice, for the clean animals that they had on the ark to use for sacrifices. You know how they got down from Mount Ararat? They followed the water. Watch that throughout your Bible. Follow the water. They followed the water down and they got into what they call the Fertile Crescent where the Tigris and the Euphrates River come together. And we were one people. We got our languages a little separated at the Tower of Babel, but we're still one people. And then God took Avram. And he said to Avram, you know, I'm going to do something different with you. 
and God took Avram to a place and put him in a deep sleep and he divided the sacrifices and he put them on each side and in this deep sleep by the Spirit of God God took Avram in Genesis chapter 12 and he passed through those animals and God said I'm going to make a new person of you you're going to cross over you're going to be the Habrim the Habraim the people who crossed over and I'm going to make a new people of you and the people are going to be called the Hebrew people and I will bless those that bless you and I will curse those that curse you and in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed and here we have a people here we have a new people church don't help God when God tells you something and you believe it and you accept it and you take it in and you trust God I want to warn you I'm going to give you fair and square clear as a bell don't help God God said I'm going to give you a son and through that sun, you're going to be a people like all the stars of the heavens and all the sand of the sea. And Abram said, but all I have is Eleazar of Damascus. All I have is my servant. I have no children. And my wife is far above the years. And me, I'm already dead. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go to Africa. And we'll take the Egyptian African Hagar. And I'll help you out. We'll do something, but let me help you. You can't keep your promise to me, so let me help you. And three visitors came before the tent of the desert people, following the water. And they said to Avram, you're going to have a son. And he said, what? And in the tent, and you have to, you'll see the Bedouin when you're in Israel. You'll see the Bedouin tent. And you'll see that in the front part of the tent of the Bedouin, the Bedouin, you'll see that the women are not allowed in the front. They're in the back. The tent is divided into four sections. Hospitality, the men, the women, and the animal. And the women are in the back. And Sarah is listening. And Sarah laughed. Do you remember that? And the angel of the Lord said to Sarah, you laugh within yourself. Sarah said, no, my Lord, I did not laugh. You know what the boy's name is? Yitzhak. You know what it means? Laughter. Church, don't help God. Don't do it. Don't help God. Wait for God. And God will fulfill his promises to you just like he did to Abraham. Watch the Hebrew people now. Watch what God is doing with these people. Abraham, take your son. How many sons does Abraham have, church? At this point in time in the story of Israel, how many sons does Abraham have? How many sons does I, I got one and two. Let's argue. How many sons does Abraham have? Two sons. Name them. Ishmael and Isaac. Is that right? Ishmael and Isaac? God said, take your son, your only son, that I will tell you of. Don't help God. Don't help God. Because when you help God, you take people outside of the will of God. Look at Ishmael, outside of the will of God, because now God said Isaac is going to be his only son. Father, I see the wood, and I, I, I see the fire. But uh, uh, Father, Abba, where's the sacrifice? Abraham said, son, God sees the need and will provide the sacrifice. How many witnesses did he take with him? Yeah. Everything must be done in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Genesis chapter 22. How many witnesses did he take with him? Two. 
You have the two witnesses throughout the scriptures, ladies and gentlemen. You have the scripture. It's all about the nation of Israel when you get to the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 12. It's all about the two witnesses. How far away did he leave the two witnesses? Wait here. How far away? Friday, Saturday, and a half a day Sunday? How far away did he leave the three, two witnesses? A three-day journey. Wait here. I and the boy will come back to you. Right there in Genesis chapter 22, following the history of the Hebrew people and the nation of Israel, you see the miraculous resurrection of the promised son who is going to be the Messiah. I'm going to sacrifice the boy. You wait here. I and the lad will come back to you. Folks, Abraham believed God. Can you imagine the story that those two witnesses wanted to hear? As Isaac and Abraham came back over the hill and as Isaac and Abraham came back down to that oasis with those two witnesses, can you imagine? Abraham, Isaac, Isaac, what happened? Tell us what happened. Where did you go? Well, we went to the land of Salem. You remember where Abraham paid tithes and offerings to the high priest of God, Melchizedek? We went to the land of Salem and we went to a high place in the land of Salem, the land of peace. And what happened there? Well, God provided. God saw a need and he provided a ram caught in a thicket. Where was it again? It was Salem. And, and, and God, Jehovah provided? Yes. It's say like, Yeru, Yeru Shalom. Yeru Shalom. The place where God will see the need and provide for the peace of your heart. Jerusalem. Jerusalem, there's no other city like it. The place where God sees a need and provides the peace. And the Hebrew people through Abraham were eternally attached to the city of Jerusalem. We go throughout the book of Genesis. Oh, we could go from story to story to story to story. But we see an attachment of the Hebrew people to this land. Everyone wants to take this land away from the Hebrew people. And church, in your Bible, in your Bible, do you believe the Bible? If you don't believe the Bible, you're in the wrong place. I'm not going to try to convince you of the truth of the Bible. We have to take the Bible by faith, but if you don't believe the Bible, you're in the wrong place. In the Bible, there are three times that the Hebrew people are in their land. The land that God promised to them, Genesis 12, Genesis 17, Genesis 24, through Isaac, the, the, the land that God promised to them. Three times they're in the land. And they are dispersed out of that land. The first time we see it is what we know of as the Exodus or the Passover. We got into trouble. We got into a famine. We went into the land. We tried to help God. We sold Joseph into slavery. God meant it for good, and Joseph was there to deliver his people. I want to show you something. Biblical Israel is not based on ethnicity. You with me? Biblical Israel is not based on ethnicity. Is my father still alive? And Joseph sent for his father, and Joseph sent for his brother Benjamin, and when Jacob came into Egypt, when the Pharaoh was preparing to flee, what the, what, to allow the people to flee and the people to come out. And Jacob looked at those two Gentile boys whose mother was an Egyptian queen. 
And he said to Joseph, whose are these? Ephraim and Manasseh. And Joseph said, Papa, they're yours. And they were forever adopted in. And the people went back into their land. I can't go through the entire history of the judges and the prophets. But we left the land again. We left the land again after the fall of King Solomon. We had a civil war. The land was divided. We went into the Assyrian Babylonian captivity. We were in the Assyrian Babylonian captivity 70 years. When Ezra discovered the word of God, probably the book of Deuteronomy, and they read the word of God and they returned back to the Torah. And when they returned back to the Torah, they returned back to the biblical holy days. And when they returned back to the biblical holy days, there came the decree of Artaxerxes in 444 BC that allowed them to go back into their land. That's where they were in the time of Jesus. But a funny thing happened on the way to Rome, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire completely subjugated the land and the people and again wanted to drive the people out of their land. And the people submitted and submitted and submitted to the Roman Empire until they couldn't stand it any longer. Judaism became so corrupt, priests were fleeing the temple and going into the desert, into Qumran, which you'll visit when you visit the, the, the ministry of Yochanan the Immerser, John the Baptist, and, and you'll visit Qumran and you'll see the city they established there in the Essene community where they attempted to go back to biblical Judaism at the foot of Masada. And they rebelled against the Romans until in the year 70, the Romans said enough of this. And they destroyed Jerusalem and they burned the temple, the center of Judaism. Anybody know what the temple was made of? You don't make houses, you don't make buildings of wood in Israel. Well, you'll get there, you'll see, there's no hardwood in Israel. When the Bible says that Jesus was a carpenter, the Greek word is tekton, and it means builder, and in Israel, you're builders with stone. Jesus was a stonemason. And the temple was made of stone. It was made of Jerusalemite limestone. And the Romans took huge olive trees full of olive oil and they set them on fire and they drove them into the stones of the temple and the wood burned and the rocks boiled from the inside and exploded. The limestone, 80% water, blew until there was not one stone left upon another. And by the year 73 in the fall of Masada, the Jews were driven from their land the third time. There is one more return. Only one, according to the Bible, according to the word of God as we have it, according to the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 37, according to the prophecy of Jeremiah chapter 25, according to the prophecies given to us in the book of Revelation. And by the way, the Jews knew it. When you visit Masada, when you go up to the top of Masada, and when you visit the excavations at Masada, your guide will tell you that before they gave their life to the Romans, they took one chapter of scripture. They rolled it up and put it in a jar and they buried it for the future and it was found after the Six Day War in 1967 and when it was unfurled, when it was, when it was opened, when it was translated, it was word for word as we have it in our Bible, Ezekiel chapter 37. 
the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me out in the spirit of a valley. And it was a valley full of death. But the angel of the Lord said to Ezekiel, can these bones live? And I said, O oh Lord God, you know. And we have the prophecy of the restoration, the third and final restoration of the nation of Israel. And everybody wants to take Israel away from the Hebrew people. So the Romans left. Who did they leave it with? They left it with the people of the sea on the coast, on the Mediterranean coast. They were called in your Bible the Philistines. What did we do after World War I? The British tweaked their name a little bit. You've got to know the history of World War I. You've got to know Winston Churchill. You've got to know T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia and all the promises the British made to the Arabs and all the promises the British made to the Jews. You can't keep promises to both people. So they changed the name of the Philistines to the Palestinians. Everybody wants to take the land away from Israel. But according to your Bible, according to the inerrant, infallible, inspired word of God, there is one third and final regathering of the Hebrew people back into their land. And ladies and gentlemen, you're living through it right now. And these things that happen on the news. How many, you, do, do you know Jerusalem is 700,000 people? You can't even get to it. There's no airport. There's no train station. You've got to get on highway number one and you've got to climb and climb and climb and climb. You'll see cars and buses on the side of the road. The engines are burned out going up the Judean hills because where are they going to? The lion, the Ariel, the lion of the tribe of Judah overlooking the land of Judah. You can't get to, you've got to be going to Jerusalem. You can't drop by. Jerusalem's always in the news, every week. Israel's in the news, every week. Israel, the size of the state of New Jersey. Israel, a country that has just reached eight million people. Always in the news. Everybody wants to take it away from the Hebrew people. But God has a plan. You want signs? You want something to watch? You want to look forward to the second coming of the Lord? You can't do it by watching the church. You have to watch God's timepiece. You have to, what time is it? See the first thing you do? You look at a timepiece. You all have the same question. What time is it? The clock's right there. All you got to do is look at it. But no, what have you got to do? You got to look at a timepiece that's familiar to you. Israel is God's timepiece. And if you want to know, which everybody does, where we are on God's time plan, you have to look at Israel. You have to look. You don't have to like it. You don't have to love it. But if you're going to believe your Bible, you better understand it. If you're going to believe your Bible, you, God said, I'll bless those that bless you. you uh, how are you going to bless the Hebrew people? The greatest, what is the greatest gift that you have? The greatest gift that you have is the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and your salvation. The greatest blessing you can be to the Hebrew people is to share Jesus with them. I will bless those that bless you. How do you curse someone? Will you use a string of profane language? No. How do you curse someone? You simply withhold the gospel from them. And you curse them, you damn them to an eternity without God forever. I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. And in you, that's you, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. How are all the families of the earth going to be blessed through one people? Jesus. It's right here in your hand. You've got to know and understand the biblical calendar, the biblical holy days, God's plan and purpose for Israel. It's got to excite you. It's got to stir your emotions within you. You've got to praise and worship and understand that Jesus was a Jew. The Bible you have is a Jewish book.
It's written by Jews to Jews, for Jews, and about Jews. Its central theme is the redemption of the Jewish people through a Jewish Messiah. And by the grace of God, provision was made for you, the wild olive branch that has been grafted into the natural tree. And you won't even understand that until you stand and hold an olive branch in your hand. You can't see the difference when the olive branch is it's the gospel message in a tree. You know how the olive tree reproduces? Not from the limbs. The olive tree reproduces from the roots. New shoots. Nitsor. To, to be born again. The leaves on the olive tree. Silver on one side. Green on the other. Redemption. And new birth. Everything about the olive tree is the gospel. That's why the Apostle Paul used the illustration in the scriptures. I'll bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you and in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Yes, I came here this morning to teach you that Israel is in its third and final restoration. But church, I've also come here this morning to plead with you about Jewish evangelism. We need to share the gospel with everyone. I'm well aware of that. I packed up my youngest son and his family and sent them to the desert in Mexico because everybody needs to hear the gospel. Five children's homes, orphanages, houses, pastors, schools in Mexico. Everybody's here. Got it. But you know what? The Jewish people have become the great omission in the great commission of Matthew 28, 18 through 20. My people are dying and on their way to a Christless eternity because we think they have some special inside track with God. And that's just not true. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you pray with me? Would you help me? Would you go to Israel? Would you visit Israel? Would you understand the holy days? Would you take time to understand Israel's glorious future? And let that motivate you to helping us reach the Jewish people with the gospel. Amen. Abba Father, thank you for this opportunity to share and to teach. Lord, there's so much about Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jesus, and the restoration, the plan, and the future. But Lord, we're here today. We're here now. You're touching us at this moment. And help us to do what it is that you've called us to do in this moment. To reach people with your salvation message. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor, can I go ahead and talk about this? Uh, this little brochure, entitled Chosen People Ministries, has a threefold purpose. Uh, first of all, we publish an international newsletter entitled The Chosen People. I'm sure many of you receive it from the times that I've been here in the past. Bonnie and I publish also a personal prayer letter that we desperately want you to have to continue our relationship that we have this morning. And we can continue to tell you about our ministry and share with you what's going on in the Tri-County area about what we're doing. But in order to do that, I need for you to trust me with your name and address. If you'll open up this brochure, uh, there's a place under Chosen People Ministries that calls for your name, address, and that information. Would you please take a pen or a pencil? Would you go ahead and fill that out, please? Uh, we're going to send you the international newsletter. We're going to send you our personal prayer letter. And should you choose to give a contribution... We're going to send you a receipt for that, and I'll even send you information about going to Israel. Uh, no obligation. You don't have to go with me. I just want you to go. Uh, please fill this out with your name and address. It says, please send me your newsletter. And if you would check that box after you fill it out with your name and address, that gives us permission 
to send you the newsletter and the prayer letter. And then it says, I am contributing blank. The church, I don't want you to leave that blank. I, I would like to graciously and politely ask you for an offering. Uh, this offering is not for me, but it will go through chosen people ministries and be properly received, be properly acknowledged, and then will be designated back to our work here in Florida. I, I would like for your contribution to be as generous as possible. Uh, Pastor, do we want to make checks out to the church or to chosen people? Uh, however you'd like to do it. Uh, Okay, uh, it, it, the easiest, it, you'll, you'll be received properly, <clears throat> you'll be acknowledged, <clears throat> excuse me, properly, but the easiest way is for you to make checks out to chosen people ministries. Now, if you give through debit card, or if you use a debit or a credit card, look on the bottom. Bonnie and I are just coming into the 21st century and we're learning, we're learning to stop writing checks and learning to use our debit card, but we're old, so it takes us extra time. On the bottom it says, please charge my contribution, and there's the blank. Now that charge, that word means either charge to your debit card or credit card, makes no difference. Then you put the amount, <clears throat> you put the number, you sign it, you put the expiration date, and that little stupid three number verification code. Now listen, we're gonna be very careful with these. We'll be very righteous with these. They'll go to the office in New York. They'll be entered into the computer. They'll be taken care of by our financial department very carefully. Then they'll be shredded. We haven't had a problem. And Lord willing, yours won't be the first one. But <laughs> please feel comfortable uh, I give you my word as your brother in the Lord. I'm not going to steal your information. It's going to go right into the CPM computer. But you can be as generous as you like using a credit or debit card. Then tear this off. If it's a check or cash, just fold it over. And when you fold it over, you're going to see, when you see the clock say 11-11, Many of you have digital clocks, but when you see the clock say 11-11, remember to pray for Chosen People Ministries and our outreach to the Jewish people. Romans 11-11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Salvation came to you through the Jews. Help us take the gospel back to the Jewish people. Thank you very much. And uh, I don't know, you let them know how to take this up. And I'm gonna be back at the literature table to, uh, to visit and fellowship with people. God bless you and thank you for your patience and your willingness to have me again. And I wanna say one more time, please consider going to Israel with your pastor. You'll never be the same, amen?